you can find out more about how to get involved with the persecuted church, uh, opendoors.org. But you watch that video, and I don't know, the first time I saw it, I was a little surprised. Those are some pretty staggering statistics, if you think about it. One in eight Christians around the world are subjected to persecution. Now stop and think about that just in this room. You count off eight people, boom, there's a person persecuted. Eight more, boom, there's another one. That's it's pretty amazing. 340 million live in a place where they're discriminated against or persecuted because they're Christians. 340 million. Folks, you, you understand that's the population of the United States. It's like a, a whole nation of people. A statistic that wasn't on the videos, a statistic of those who are killed worldwide in 2020 as a result of being Christians. There were 4,761 Christians killed for their faith in 2020. Now th stop and think about that. 4,761, that's almost two-thirds of the population of our island in one year, gone. So in less than two years, you could wipe out the entire population of Molokai, and that would be equivalent to how many are dying in the world just because of their Christian faith. That's over 13 a day. So today, by the time we go to bed, 13 people would have sacrificed their life somewhere in the world because of their Christianity. I mean, let, let that sink in a little bit. It, it's so hard for us because we don't know. We're concerned about persecution here that, you know, we are going to be called names. Or, you know, somebody's going to think we're weird because we believe a certain way. We're talking about life and death situation in many parts of the world. And it's, and it's not about a label. It's not about just because they're called Christians. It's, it's because ultimately of what they hold to, the beliefs that they have. It's about what we talked about a few weeks ago. It's about conviction. You remember our definition for conviction? We'll throw it up there on the screen again. It's that rock-solid certainty that something is absolutely true, resulting in the willingness to take a stand for it, regardless of the consequences. These folks that are being persecuted and that are literally giving their lives are people that have a conviction. They are rock-solidly certain that the truth of Christianity is worth being persecuted for, and ultimately, if necessary, worth dying for. And that's what we've been looking at over these last several weeks. These, these ideas, these doctrines, these teachings, we, we kind of shy away from words like doctrine because it sounds kind of high and lofty. But really, doctrine is just about teaching that guides a person's life and their lifestyle. And these folks are dying because they believe that Christianity and the, the Christian faith is absolutely true. They believe that the doctrines, the teachings are worth living for and if necessary, dying for. And the heart, the doctrine that's at the heart of the Christian message is the doctrine of the gospel. And today as we um, continue this series looking at some of these doctrines that are worth dying for. We're going to take a closer look at the heart of the Christian faith, the idea of the gospel. Now, I know as soon as I say that to a bunch of people that are in church most of the time, we go, I already know what the gospel is. Well, do you? We had to peel it back, and I said to you, give me the simple gospel. What would you say? What would you give me? If I, if I ask you to back up whatever you said with Scripture, could you give it to me? Could you show me in the Bible where what you're saying is validated? And for some of you, you probably could, but for many of us, it's just become something that we hear all the time, and like so many other things that we hear so often, it just kind of flies over the top of our head. So I want us to zero in on this idea of the gospel this morning. We're going to look first of all at the content. What is the gospel? And then we're going to finish off with some characteristics. Not Certainly not all the characteristics, but some that I think 
would be important for us to know. First of all, before we get into the meat of it, the Greek word translated gospel shows up about 76 times in the New Testament. It's pretty significant. 76 times we see this word, and the word in the Greek is euangelion. And it's from two words, uh, one meaning good, the second word meaning to proclaim or to tell. It literally means good news. That's what the word in the original means. We have called it the gospel uh, many times in the New Living Translation, if you're using that, it will say good news. In fact, this morning during our scripture reading in 1 Corinthians 15, that's the way it was translated. Paul says, let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached. Some of your translations are going to say gospel. But literally, the literal translation of that word from the Greek is the good news. So the gospel is news, which means it's a message. A message or news has content, right? I mean, when you talk about, when we say something like, hey, did you see the news today? What are we talking about? We're talking about, did you hear the message about what's going on in the world today? Or what's going on in our state today? Or what's happening in our county? Whatever the case may be, whatever the news that you're talking about, it's about a message it's about, it has content, right? So the gospel, this good news, has content. And listen, Scripture tells us it's vitally important that we get the content of the gospel right. Let me show you how important it is. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8, Paul said this, Let God's curse fall on anyone including us or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news. There's our word, euangelion, gospel. Verse 9, I say again what we have said before. If anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcomed, let that person be cursed. Folks, do you understand what Paul is saying here? He's saying, listen, if anybody comes along and preaches a gospel, a, something they title good news, that is not the good news that you have heard from us, my desire is that they be banned from the presence of God for all eternity. That's what it means to be cursed. You go, oh my goodness, how could Paul say something that sounds so like harsh and extreme? But do you understand what Paul is saying here? This gospel is eternally vital. And if we don't get it right, then what we're literally doing is helping to send people to a destiny, an eternal destiny without God and so Paul says, look, if you're going to preach a message like that, I would rather that person be banned from God's presence than for them to corrupt as many people as they can and ban them from God's presence. Do so you understand how important this is? When we talk about the gospel, we're not talking about just a little side issue. That's why when I opened this morning, I said, this is the heart of Christianity. This is... This is where it all comes down to, folks, is this good news that Paul says, man, we better get it right, and we better not corrupt it, and we better not be guilty of teaching anything less than the true gospel. That's why when I said to you, hey, do you know what the content of the gospel is? Man, that's serious stuff. We better make sure that we get this thing right. So you go, man, how, how can we know that we've got it right? Well, it's all through Scripture, but there is a very clear passage that we just read right here in 1 Corinthians 15 that gives us the content of the gospel message. And this is where we're going to park for the first part of our time together this morning. Let's look at it again. Verse 1 of chapter 15. Paul says, let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news, the gospel I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it now. Okay, Paul, well, what is it? Well, down in verse 3, he starts going into it. I passed on to you what was most important. 
And what had also been passed on to me, here it is, Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. In a nutshell, that is the gospel message. And I want you to notice before we jump into it, what he says here. He says, I passed on to you what was most important. The word there in the original is the word protos. We talk about something being uh, a prototype. First is what we mean. This is the first of this kind when we say something is a prototype. It comes from this word. Paul's saying, listen, this is the first, the primary, the most important doctrine of all is what he's saying. This is what it's all about. Paul's putting emphasis on how important this is. And he said, look, I'm passing it on to you as it was passed on to me. Now, let me give you a little background on this. These verses from verses 3 to 7, most Bible teachers believe that this was an ancient creed, that Paul was just reciting an ancient creed, probably the oldest Christian creed that we have. And it dates back to within just a few years after the death of Christ. And Paul says, look, this was given to me, and I'm giving it to you. And you go, well, when, when did Paul get this? Well, we don't know exactly because he doesn't tell us. But more than likely, it's when he got baptized that he was reciting what he believed. Because baptism doesn't get you saved. It's what you believe that brings salvation. Baptism is just a demonstration that you have believed that. And so in many places, they ask you, what is it that you are believing before you get baptized? When we baptize folks, we ask them to give a short testimony. Can you give a testimony of what God has done in your life? And what we're saying is, basically, why are you here? Why are you standing in this water? Why are you going to get dunked under? What is, this, what is the deal here? And so more than likely, Paul recited this type of creed before or as he was getting baptized. Whatever the case is, again, it dates back to within just a few years of the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. And Paul gives us here the absolute simplest breakdown of the gospel. And here it is, number one. The substitutionary death of Jesus. Now let me explain what that means because, again, sometimes we look at things and go, oh, turn it off. It's kind of like me and math. When I was a kid and I took math, as soon as math, we were told to take our math books off, I turned out, tuned out, and I'm done, right? I just wasn't a math guy. Sometimes we see some words and we go, oh, too big, I'm done. Trust me, the only reason I put that up there is because there's no other word that is good enough to explain what this is all about, and I'm going to explain it to you. Substitutionary death, what does that mean? Well, what's, what's in the word substitutionary? Substitute, Right? That's exactly what this means. Look what it says. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Christ died for our sins just as the scripture said. Notice, it doesn't simply say that Christ died. It doesn't just say Christ died and then go on from there. It, it adds Christ died for our sins. It, it, you might understand it better by saying or because of our sin. Christ died because of our sin. And this was prophesied, by the way, back in the Old Testament. Take a look at the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53. He's prophesying about the coming Messiah. Look what he says. Yet it is our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Do you see that over and over again, even in the prophecy? Our weakness, our sorrow, our rebellion, our sin, so that we could be whole, so that we could be healed. Our sin was laid on him. It was about us. He did it in our stead, in our behalf. 
Paul says this in Galatians 1.4. Jesus gave his life, here it is, for our sins. Just as God our Father planned in order, look, to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. Peter says it like this, 1 Peter 3.18. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. What's he saying? The same thing that Paul says in that verse up top. That he suffered, he died for our sins, and he rescued us. Bringing us safely home to God is just another way of saying he rescued us. So what did Jesus do? Jesus died in our place. He was the substitute that died in our place. Think about it like this. Sin is breaking God's law, which really is not measuring up to God's character, right? We've talked about this. Sin isn't just about a list of do's and don'ts that God has, and I don't uh, measure up to those, and so I've sinned. Ultimately, those do's and don'ts are reflections of the character of God, right? God tells us not to kill because God is life. God tells us to be kind because God is love. So all of the things that we look at and say, oh, these, these are the rules, we miss it if we just park on the rules. They are reflections of the character of God. So when we don't measure up to God, that's our sin. That's sin. We don't measure up, right? Um, maybe you've come across a passage of Scripture where it talks about being ungodly. Now think about that for a minute. What does that mean? Ungodly means I'm not like God. I am unlike God. I am ungodly, right? So as an individual, can I look at myself and say that I'm ungodly? Yes, in and of myself, I am not like God. And no matter what you think of yourself, neither are you. None of us measure up, right? So sin... If we want to make it real simple, it's breaking God's law. Now, when you break a law, there's always a what? There's a consequence or a penalty, right? So, in our system of law, when you break the law and there's a penalty, if you pay the price of that penalty, you go free. So, let's suppose that I break a law and I can't pay the penalty, right? Let's suppose that the law I break, whatever it is, the penalty is I owe a million dollars. I can't pay a million. I don't have a million dollars. I can't pay a million dollars. Most of you couldn't do that either. And if you could, come see me after church. We'll talk. But if, you, if you're like me and you couldn't pay the million bucks, well, what happens? Well, the powers that be say, well, you, you're going to go to jail. We're going to lock you up. Well, now I really can't pay it. Because I can't even work for it. Now, oh, maybe they give me a little job of making license plates, but I don't make enough money to earn a million bucks in my lifetime, and so I'm stuck in jail because I can't pay my fine. What I need is someone who has a million bucks to step in and pay my fine for me. If I had someone who had the the price of the penalty who would step in and say, I will pay this on his behalf, what is he doing? He is taking his money and using as if it were my money. He's paying for my penalty as if it was his penalty. He is being my substitute And once the fine is paid, I go free, not because I paid the debt, but because he paid it on my behalf. Folks, that's exactly what substitutionary death is all about. It's Jesus paying the penalty that we could never pay because it's an infinite debt and only an infinite being can pay an infinite debt. It would be like me owing a million bucks in today's world. No way I can pay it. No way you and I as humans can pay an infinite debt. It takes an infinite God to pay an infinite debt. 
let me give it to you like this, and I'll give you a little, get a little cartoon analogy, if that will help you out. 1 John 4.10 says this, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sin. Now, this is a great verse and it's a pretty good translation, but let me tell you why I don't like it that much. Because that word sacrifice in the original, it means so much more than just a sacrifice. That's good. In certain translations, it's an old word. Maybe you've heard of it before. It's the word propitiation. You go, man, what on earth does that mean? Well, some of your translations, if you have NIV, I think it says atoning sacrifice. That's good too, but it really doesn't help. So I'm going to go back to this word propitiation because it means appeaser, one who appeases wrath. Picture, if you will, maybe go back in time to the cartoon character with the handlebar mustache who was always trying to get the girl in trouble so that he could get ultimately get the hero in trouble. And so let's suppose that that handlebar mustache guy is Satan. And let's suppose that we're the damsel in distress. Satan comes by and somehow tricks us into following him. And what happens is we end up getting bound in our sin. We get roped up, so to speak, in our sin. We are called in Scripture slaves to sin. We are tied to the tracks, so to speak. Well, if you're familiar with these old style cartoons, the girl is on the tracks, can't do anything because she's bound and tied up by these ropes. And down the tracks, down just outside of the screen, we hear the noise of a train. Oh my goodness, the train is coming. And pretty soon we see it as it enters into the screen and the smoke is billowing and it's headed right for the girl on the tracks. And the guy with the handlebar mustache is standing behind the bushes waiting for something really bad to happen and he's laughing and thinking this is the greatest thing in the world and all of a sudden out of nowhere shows up our hero riding on his famous stallion he makes his way down the hill as fast as he can and the train is barreling toward the girl and the hero is barreling down the hill and the evil guy in the bushes is having a ball and all of a sudden at the last minute when things look so bad, the hero jumps off his horse, picks up the girl, throws her to safety and is hit by the train. You say, wait a minute, I don't remember a cartoon like that. It's my story, I can tell the hell I want, right? The train is the judgment of God that has to come because God is just and he has to punish sin. We're tied in our sin. Slaves to our sin can't save ourselves. Tied to the track with God's judgment barreling down on us. And the Bible says that just the right time, Jesus came and he was the substitute who took the judgment of God on himself for our sin. Do you see it? It's not just, folks, that Jesus died. Everybody's going to die. Jesus died as a substitute for you and me. And there was no way any of us could pay that price. None of us could pay it. And so that's why it says here in 1 John 4, this is real love. We talked about this last week when we were looking at the Trinity. We screwed up. We, we got booted out of the party. And God said, but I want you in the party. And so the only way to do this is for me to demonstrate my love by stepping out of eternity into time and becoming a man and dying in your place. Substitutionary death. Paul says, look, look, Corinthian believers, I want to share with you, I want to go over with you one more time the first 
foremost, most important, the heart of Christianity. And here it is. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Here's number two. And by the way, there's just two. It's that simple. Look what he said. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture says. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture says. The second part of the gospel is the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus. Paul said, look, the most important, the, the, the primary is the substitutionary death and the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus. I want you to notice something. Look at, look at that verse. It says, Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried. Now, why on earth does it say that? Why does it say he was buried? Well, it's verification that he was really dead. You don't, you don't bury live people. You bury people that you know are dead, right? Besides that, guess what? Years later, somebody came along and said, well, I got a theory for this whole thing about Jesus. His body was never in the grave in the first place. That's why it appeared to be empty. Because what usually happened to people that died by crucifixion, the Romans didn't want to mess with them, so they threw them out on the garbage heap, literally, the garbage heap outside of town, and the dogs would eat their bodies, and their bodies would rot, and there was no body. So that's why there was no body in the, in the tomb, because Jesus never even made it to the tomb. He died, and his body was thrown out on a garbage heap. And folks, there are so many problems with that theory. But one of them is right here in Scripture, because Paul wants to make sure that we understand, yeah, he died, but you need to know he was also buried. He really was put in a tomb. And you know what? All the historical documents outside of the Bible that we have reference to with regard to the death of Christ verify that he was put in a tomb. He was buried. Then it says he rose again. Right? Look at Romans 1.4. Look what it says. He was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, he is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Listen, do you understand? Somebody says, look, I don't get the resurrection thing. I, you know, I, I, I understand as much as I can, I understand that Jesus died for our sin. But what's the, why is the resurrection such a big deal? I mean, it's kind of a cool story, but is it really all that important? It is absolutely vital to the message of the gospel because the resurrection proves that everything that Jesus did was real. And it also proves, according to Romans 1, that he was the Son of God. Let me show you what it says here. It says he was shown to be the Son of God. That word shown is a very interesting word. It is the word where we get our English word horizon. You say, what is a horizon? When we look out and we say, oh, I looked into the horizon. Well, what is that? That's where the sky meets the earth, right? There's kind of this line, this invisible line where the sky meets the earth. It means that the earth and the sky, all they are different at this point. So what's Paul using this word for? Because he's saying that the resurrection demonstrated that Jesus isn't like us. That he is a human, but he is God in the flesh. And the thing that showed that to be true was the resurrection. That's what Paul's saying here. The resurrection was vital because it pointed to the validity that Jesus was the God-man who was able to make this payment, and because of the payment, it was all good. See, it's not about Jesus dying to be a good example. Well, he, he wanted to show us what real love looked like. Of course it shows us what real love looks like, but folks, I needed more than just somebody to show me what love looks like. I needed somebody to pay this infinite debt. And as we already said, the only one that could pay an infinite debt is an infinite God. So how do I know that Jesus is infinite God? Because he rose from the dead. And that proved that everything he said and everything he did was valid and true. 
Do you realize Jesus prophesied his own resurrection? I mean, several places, but let me read you this, Matthew 16, 21. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, and on the third day, he would raise from the dead. This is Jesus telling his disciples, guys, i got to tell you what's going to happen. I want to prepare you. When we go to Jerusalem eventually, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to, I'm going to suffer some really bad things from these guys. Ultimately, they're going to kill me. But don't worry, I'm going to rise again from the dead. Now see, you might be able to predict your own death. Especially if you keep it real generic. Someday I'm going to die. Oh my gosh, he's prophesying. But to predict you're going to rise again and the time frame of when you're going to rise again, not only am I going to rise again, I'm going to rise again in three days. See, when Jesus rose again from the dead, what do you think the disciples eventually thought? And the scripture tells us they remembered what he said. He said he was going to rise from the dead. Oh my goodness, he, he really did it. What does that mean? That means he's the I am. It means he's God. It means, it means that that sacrifice that he made on the cross wasn't just about, about dying as an insurrectionist. It means he was dying for the sin of the world. It means it's all true. See how important the resurrection is? Some people say, well, I think Jesus rose again from the dead, but it's a spiritual resurrection. And it kind of takes place in us too. We kind of spiritually rise when we believe in Jesus. That is a bunch of nonsense. Scripture is very clear that Jesus rose literally. It was a bodily, literal resurrection. In fact, we don't have time to go into it. We've done this uh, on several occasions before. But, but all the evidence points to the fact that that tomb was empty. And there's no other theory that fits than the one that he literally, bodily, rose again from the dead. And folks, it's absolutely vital to the gospel message. Paul says, listen, I want to tell you what's primary, what's important, what's number one, and here it is, that Jesus died for our sin. And he rose again. And then he goes on and he wants to make sure that you know that he was seen. It wasn't just something I made up. He says in verse 5, he was seen by Peter, then by the twelve, and after he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Why is he saying that? If you want to go question them, most of them are still alive. Go ahead and question them. That's what he was saying to these guys. Though some of them have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. What's Paul doing? He's saying, look, this isn't just some whim of an idea that I made up somewhere to sound good. There are actually eyewitnesses to the risen Lord. So when somebody says, what's the gospel? Here it is, plain and simple. Jesus died in our place and he rose again to prove that that debt was paid and that he really was and is God. That's it, folks. That's it. It's that simple, but it's, it's that vital. And let me, as we close out, I want to give you very quickly some characteristics that are so important about this message. Here it is, number one. The gospel is exclusive. What do you mean by that? Acts 4.12, it says this, there's salvation in no one else God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. That's exclusive, folks. Jesus was exclusive. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's an exclusive message. There is no other, Scripture says. See, and this is hard for a lot of people. In fact, we've had folk leave this church because of this issue right here. Well, I think, there, I think there might be multiple ways. Show me. And if there are multiple ways, why on earth would Jesus have to go through what he went through? If there's multiple ways, that means there's easier solutions. 
And if there are easier solutions, then why on earth would God allow his son to go through what he went through? It doesn't make any sense. Well, I just think that there, you know, there must be more ways. So you want me to base my eternal destiny and the message I preach for others' eternal destiny on what you think? I can't do it. I won't do it. Number two, not only is it an exclusive message, the gospel is inclusive. This is, this is really cool. Because it's not just for a select few people. Look what it says in Romans 1.16. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this good news, of this gospel about Christ. It's the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. Everyone. It, it's not discriminatory. Everyone. Romans 10, 3, 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then, of course, we have John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the what? World that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. What is that saying? It is an inclusive message. This isn't a Jewish message. It's not a black man's message. It's not a white man's message. It's not a Hawaiian message, a Samoan message. It is a message for everyone. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. And that's a lot of what's going around in our country right now. That somehow Christianity is just for the white guy. Which is really dumb when you stop and think about it because it started with a Jewish guy. White guys didn't get it for a long time after that. In fact, all the evidence points that the folks in Africa got it before the folks in Europe. Folks, don't let people take this beautiful message of reconciliation. Listen, the gospel isn't about reconciling the races, but it does that. It's about reconciling us to God. And when you get reconciled to God, you get reconciled to people. You want to know the answer to racism in our country? It's not more laws. It's not tearing down statues. It's not rioting. It's not burning cars, looting businesses. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's about the love of God to us. And as we grasp that, we love others. And there is no color differentiation. Look it up in Ephesians 2. It's so clear that the wall of separation between the races has been broken down by the gospel. It's right there. And yet we have people running around in our churches today talking about all this crazy nonsense of racial reconciliation. It will never come apart from the love of God. Never. You, you, will, you will make it worse. Now, don't misunderstand me. We have a problem. I'm not saying that we don't have it, but we have huge problems with racial issues in our country. But we're going about solving them in all the wrong ways. It is this. We've been made in the image of God. All of us. And the designer and the creator knows how to fix what's broken. And when we try to fix it our own way, guess what happens? Tower of Babel stuff. Absolute confusion. And that's what's happening right before our eyes today. It's the gospel of love. The gospel of Christ. That Christ came to die for sinners. It doesn't, it doesn't say what nationality. It doesn't say what culture. It just says everyone. Because we are all sinners. We're all in need. And that is the only message that's going to bring any kind of racial reconciliation. Well, it's exclusive. It's inclusive. Number three, it's divisive. Wow. Really? Yeah. Let me tell you what I mean. John 3.36, this was Jesus' words. Anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. That's divisive. Jesus, is, he's, he's putting a dividing line. Look what he says. If you believe in God's Son, you have eternal life. If you don't believe, 
you, you face God's judgment. That goes back to our little cartoon character, right? Let's suppose you're laying on the tracks and the hero comes to save you and goes, what are you doing? I'm going to save you. Get out of here. I think I got this thing figured out as the train is almost there. Get, leave, go. So the hero goes, okay, and he steps back, boom. You take God's judgment. That's what Jesus is saying here. This is a divisive message. There is no in-between. Well, you know, maybe if you're sincere and you believe this, 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. Again, that's divisive, folks. There's a division right there. Those who believe, we know we're being saved through this power of the, of the message. Those who uh, uh, don't believe, it's, full, it's a foolish message. It's divisive. Why is it divisive? It's a divisive message because it emphasizes our helplessness. Listen, you will never trust Christ as your Savior until you come to the point where you realize you cannot save yourself. You can't. None of us can. Romans 5, 6 says this, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for sinners. Utter, doesn't just say helpless. It says utterly helpless. In other words, there is no way in the world you could ever pay the debt. You are helpless. You are tied up to the tracks, can't do anything for yourself. Until you come to that point and that realization, you will never trust Christ as your Savior. You have to come to a point where you say, I cannot save me. It's also divisive because it requires humility. In Acts 20, 21, it says this, I have had one message for Jews and Greeks, Greek, Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God, having faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying? What is this repentance thing? Repentance means I come to a point, it's a change of mind. That's what the word means in the Greek. The word is metanoia. It means to change your mind. What do I change my mind about? I change my mind about myself. I'm not as good as I thought I was. That goes back to that helpless thing. I'm not the good guy that I keep thinking that I am. Number two, my sin is worse than I thought it was. See, I like to excuse my sin off. At least I'm not as bad as they are. At least I'm not as bad as he is. And so I excuse my sin away. And when I realize that my sin is never measured against other people, it's measured against a holy God, that changes my mind. My sin is a lot worse than I thought it was. I'm not as good as I thought I was. My sin is worse than I thought it was. And I can't save myself. That takes humility. There's no amount of good works that I can do that will ever take care of this infinite penalty. Only an infinite God can pay it. And so repentance is when I come to that point in my mind where I've changed my mind about myself, my sin, and my Savior, and I turn to Him and I say, I need you. Jesus said this in Matthew 7, 13. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate the highway to hell is broad. Its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. This is Jesus talking. What is he saying? He's, he's drawing a line again. He's saying, look, there's two ways. There's one that's really broad and easy and there's all kinds of people on that one. And that one's going right to hell. And there's another one that's very narrow and there's few people on it and that one heads to life. He's giving us this divisive message. Number four, the gospel is demonstrative. Romans 5.8, we saw this earlier. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Look at that says. God showed his great love. That word in the original could also be translated, he exhibited. He exhibited. He put on exhibit his love. How did he put on exhibit his love? By sending Jesus. You couldn't do it on your own, and so I will send my son to do it for you because I love you that much. And I want you to understand how great a love I have for you so that you will understand what a great God that I am. 
So God exhibits his love through his son. He puts him on display. You want to know how much I love you? Look at the cross. That's how much I love you. Romans 8, 39 says, No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see what that says? God's love is revealed. This love that you can't be said. Once you, once you attach yourself to it, once you say yes to this gospel message that Jesus died for you, for your sin, to pay the penalty, to be the substitute, and he rose again to prove that it's true. And once you embrace that love, guess what? Nothing can ever separate you from that love that was revealed in Christ Jesus. That is a hallelujah right there, folks. Number five, the gospel is imperative. What does that mean? That means it's absolutely necessary. 1 John 5, 11 says this, and this is what God has testified. This is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. You talk about dividing again. There it is. You got the Son, you got life. You don't have the Son, you don't have life. But God testified to the reality that life is in His Son. He loved the world so much, He said, I will demonstrate that love, how much I love, by putting my Son on a cross to exhibit the amazing love that I have for you. That's the gospel, folks. That is the true, simple message of the gospel. And if you put your faith and trust in that, not, not church attendance, not your baptism, not how much money you give to charity, not, not what a nice neighbor you are, how well you treat your pets, whatever that criteria, that will not get you a standing before an infinite God who loves you so much that He sent His Son to take the penalty on your behalf because you and I could never, ever pay an infinite debt. It took an infinite God with infinite love to step out of heaven and give us that. That is the gospel. That's what we have to stand on. That's what we have to live out. That's what we have to speak out because it's a message. It's news. It's, it's not something that people are just going to catch by watching us. They have to hear it come out of our mouths. That's why we'll preach it in this church until they close the doors and then we'll keep preaching it out on the street until they lock us up. And then we'll preach it there when they lock us up to anybody who's locked up with us that'll hear us until they stick us in solitary confinement. And then we'll yell it through the halls as loud as we can because it's true and it's eternal life to anyone who believes. And everyone needs to hear it. Amen? Amen. Lord, we come before you today. Your gospel, it's the good news. We can't do it. We never could. You did it all. God, thank you so much for your amazing love that spilled out like a fountain. We messed up. Our sin has blocked our fellowship with you. We, we can't be a part of that, that triune party of beauty that you've called us to. And so... To get us back in, you made the payment. And because of love, we have to decide if we will take that. We can slap your hand away. We can, we can, we can refuse for you to take us off the tracks. And because of love, you give us that choice. God, I don't want to presume anything about anyone in this room today. Lord, this is too important. If you're sitting here today and, and you have nodded to the gospel, you, yes, I believe Jesus died. Yes, I believe he rose again. But you have never said, I believe that that payment 
was for me. This is not just about believing a historical event. This is about putting, as we sang about this morning, your hope in him, our confident expectation that what he said was true. If you've never done that, I don't care. You may have been in the church for the last 30 years. Just be real with God and let him know, Lord, I have never embraced you as Lord and Savior. I have never taken this simple gospel message and, and said, yes, it, it is for me. And I believe that Jesus is who he said he was. He did what he said he was going to do. And I put my hope in him. The death of Jesus for my sin and the literal, real resurrection. I believe it. And if you have never done that, you've heard it, you know it, you could even recite it, but you have never embraced it, here's your call right now. Do it. Do it. Listen, this is what will divide, Jesus said, the wheat from the chaff, the real grain from the weeds. This is what divides those on the broad road and those on the narrow road. Those who have life and those who have destruction. Oh, dear friend, be, be on that road to life. God, only you know hearts. I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice this morning has embraced the truth of the gospel, the good news, the God of the universe made a way for us to rejoin the party. Thank you, God, for the gospel. Lord, I lift up our brothers and sisters around the world who stand in persecution's way. For those, even during our time this morning in worship, who gave their life because they believe this. It's a doctrine they said is worth dying for. God, I pray for courage and strength and conviction make us, Lord, champions of yours. May we always hold to your gospel. May we never be accused of holding to, teaching, encouraging anything but the substitutionary death and the literal bodily resurrection of you for our sin. In your name we pray. Amen.